We're skipping, oh, what, what are we skipping? 700 years about, I hate to skip 700 years, but that's what we're gonna have to do. Augustine is the oldest of the philosophers here on this page. Although I'm not exactly sure when Boethius was. He was not long thereafter. I can't remember exactly what year he lived, what uh, century he lived in. But it's unfortunate skipping that much time because I would have loved to have time to cover the Hellenistic schools, particularly Stoicism, the noblest of the Hellenistic schools. His attempts after the age of Socrates in Greece to keep the Socratic tradition alive and make philosophy into a way of life as indeed it is supposed to be. It's encouraging to see that Stoicism is making a bit of a comeback today, actually. Has anyone ever stumbled upon any works advocating for Stoicism online, maybe? Or it's all sorts of YouTube videos and social media things and books coming out um, advocating for Stoicism. And Stoicism goes over the top in some regards, but it does have much wisdom to share. But anyway, we're going to have to skip that. Another interesting thing we're going to be skipping is the Neoplatonic Revival. Neoplatonism. Philosophers like Plotinus did an incredible job expounding upon Plato's teachings and the forms, and especially in beauty. Amazing teachings there. These are things I always intend to incorporate into my intro fill curriculum, but it's difficult to, to squeeze so much in. Hopefully I'll somehow find a way in future semesters. Anyway, so we're fast forwarding here to Augustine, Boethius, Anselm, and Aquinas. This is a thousand years worth of philosophers, and I'm just picking a few of them. Obviously, there's much more to be said about Middle Ages philosophy than what we'll talk about in the next several minutes, but I hope we can touch on the biggest questions that they dealt with. As you no doubt noticed, and as I mentioned in the summary reading, the Middle Ages philosophers were particularly fond of, of applying philosophical approaches to questions about God. And Plato certainly did that also, as did Aristotle, but not as much as the Middle Ages philosophers did. The, um, the fact that they were philosophizing about God doesn't mean they were doing theology. So don't suppose that we've suddenly switched gears and turned this into a theology course. We haven't. Uh, theology takes for granted the teachings in a given sacred text or religion or, or church document Nothing that you've read and that we'll talk about from this discussion sheet and the reading that you did for today appeal to those things. They appeal to reason, common sense, observation, things like that. So they're truly doing philosophy, even though they're philosophizing about God and, and uh, questions pertaining to God. Uh, for those who just came in, let me go ahead and let you guys take this quiz. I hate to... I did have you miss it, but since we're talking about this stuff right now, can you guys just find a nearby room to take this in and then bring it back here when you're done? There you go. And I'll just leave this here as soon as you find it. Okay. Got it. Excellent. Just bring it right back here and put it here when you're done. Okay. Um, so the first thing, the first one, not chronologically, but in order of importance would be Aquinas. Aquinas is often considered the greatest theologian, but we're not, talk we're not going over now his theology, we're going over some of his philosophy. He was both a philosopher and a theologian. Um, of all of his various philosophical arguments, his most famous must be, I, I would say, his five ways. If you, I haven't done this before, but I assume if you do a Google search for five ways, there's all sorts of things that the phrase five ways could apply to, but it might just bring up Aquinas' five ways as the most uh, significant search result, maybe. Doesn't really matter, but it's, he's still very well known for his five ways. He wrote thousands upon thousands of pages. I mean, Plato wrote some 500,000 words, Aristotle twice that, no problem. Aquinas wrote like eight times as much as Aristotle did, and this is still just as um, in terms of writing, he didn't have much more technology than Aristotle had access to thousands of years before him, so it's quite impressive. If he had a computer, he probably would have written ten times as much as he did. He was, agree with him or disagree with him, he was certainly one of the most intelligent people who ever lived. The depth and breadth of his philosophizing is astounding. Even in logic, 
matters that we've been trying to progress in for many centuries, he still had a better grasp of than some of the best minds today. And he was, in some ways, more cutting edge than they are in the very field that they've had hundreds of extra years to work on than he was all the way back then. So of all of these thousands upon thousands of pages of writings, I gave you one. His five ways fits into one page. And since it's so short, I don't want to, I actually don't want to go picking out the details of it as I tend to do for the Platonic dialogues and the Aristotelian treatises because it's short enough to very easily just read on your own any time, as you guys already did also. So instead, I want to take our discussion today to just try and extract the essence of each of his five ways in um, a way that might make more sense than how he put it. I'm not saying I'm going to do it better than he did. I'm not. I am, I am uh, like, if Aquinas is like a giant and I'm like a little midget next to him, uh, I, I definitely can't say it better than he did, but I can try at least to use examples and put it in terms that we might be more likely to get what he's getting at. He writes incredibly densely. He packs into a couple sentences what it takes many people chapters to write. And because of how densely he writes, it, it can be very difficult sometimes to follow. Well, not as difficult, I think, as some say. Before we dive into the five ways themselves, there's a, there's a baseline understanding that we need to have about what he's even going for here. First of all, he is not trying to prove the details of any one religion's conception of God. That would be theology. You would have to draw from a sacred text, whether if you're a Christian drawing from the Bible, if you're a Muslim drawing from the Quran, if you're a Jew drawing from the, the Torah. Those documents, of course, say all sorts of things about God, and they're, but they're not necessarily philosophical. Aquinas is not, say, is not pretending he's proven any of those details about God in these five ways. All he's trying to do is lay out a few logical insights. He's trying to say, not that there must be uh, a God who is like a father and merciful and all these, which of course he believes as a Christian as he was. He's simply saying, look, combine logic with the unavoidable facts of the universe, and we seem to uh, something seems to be evident to us, and those things are as follows. If you want to take the quiz, can you just find a A couple other students are doing that now, so we're just uh, near because we're talking about the material already. So as soon as you're done, just bring it back in here. So he's trying to say that um, there's got to be some unmoved mover. There's got to be some uncaused cause. There's got to be these things are philosophical descriptions of some being that he's not pretending to have described the details of, again. So you could very easily, a parrot could very easily say in response to any of these, oh, well, who moved the unmoved mover? Oh, well, who caused the uncaused cause? Oh, well, who made God then? Who designed God? If a seven-year-old could think of an objection easily to an argument that Aquinas is putting forth, um, that objection probably kind of misses the point, considering Aquinas' uh, unbelievable intelligence. And indeed, those objections do kind of miss what he's getting at. He's not pretending to understand how exactly God, for example, could be an unmoved mover. And we can even avoid the word God from him. He's not even trying to say he understands how there can be an unmoved mover. He's just saying, and I'm just using that because it's the first of the five ways, is he's saying there must be some unmoved mover. Why? Well, the observations that we make of the universe, and if we apply simple logic to it, tell us certain things that the universe itself demands and yet is incapable of itself rendering. He doesn't say he understands how. Nobody understands how. And anybody who claims to understand how exactly this happens is, is lying because it is a mystery. But what is a mystery? Well, a mystery is not a simple contradiction, square triangle contradiction, a lie is a contradiction in any false statement. But a mystery 
also is something that goes beyond the ability of a human mind to fully encapsulate within itself. It is something that is too grand for the human mind to fully grasp. It is a mystery. The point is, with all of these five ways, the answer to the question, oh, well, who moved the first move, the unmoved mover? Oh, well, who caused the uncaused cause? Oh, well, who designed the designer of all things? The answer to all of those questions, which might seem like legitimate objections, but really the answer is, and Aquinas would be very willing to give this, is it is a mystery. I do not understand how. So you might say, okay, well, why can't I just then say it is a mystery how uh, the Big Bang banged itself? Well, it is a mystery is simultaneously the only possible answer, but it's also the one answer that one who only acknowledges the material is logically incapable of giving. Because there is no room for mystery in mechanics. Mechanics is deterministic. It is governed by physical laws. It is a mystery is not a legitimate answer. Well, working on it is a legitimate answer. But at some point you have to ask yourself, is we're working on it really the, uh, the honest thing here? Or is it indeed fundamentally mysterious? And he's trying to say that all of these things are fundamentally mysterious. They are beyond us. Um, so let's see what we think going through. Um, can, do you want to take There's it? a tree down. I saw that. Oh, I, yeah. I was, that's still yeah. down? OK. It's still down. It's can you off. just take that in a nearby yep. room and then bring it in when you're done? OK, so did I? Uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me. I haven't given the sheet to anybody yet. Whoops, oh, wait, have I? Did I hand out the sheet? No. I am having a senior moment today, my goodness. All right, let me, let me hand out the sheet now. And it's probably the same. It's definitely the same. So you two and you can hand one back. Oh, yeah, for her as well. Welcome. Welcome. No problem. Okay, so without further ado, the first way, the unmoved mover. Simple, plain English way of putting it. Well, let's just have down for that. First, there must be some first unmoved mover to initiate the chain of motion. A few things are necessary to fully understand this argument. And by the way, I know that the way I'm phrasing them on the board is not complete. These are not complete arguments as I'm putting them on the board. This is just for our memory. Memory's sake, he gives complete arguments in the actual text. There must be some first unmoved mover to initiate the chain of motion. So you walk into a bar, the first thing you see is a billiards table, a pool table that is, with the billiards balls moving all around. And the mere fact that you see them in motion, um, oh, I didn't give a sign yet. I don't think I'll bother today, because anybody who misses today is not in good shape anyway. Um, the conclusion that you come to after seeing the f that there are billiard balls in motion is that some event transpired within the seconds beforehand, and that event would be what? Yeah, someone hit the, maybe if all of the billiard balls are moving around, someone hit the, uh, what do you call it, the cue ball? It's been a while since I played pool. So you don't simply say, oh, well, I'm looking at that green ball right there, the does each color ball have a number? Am I supposed to know which number goes? Oh, goodness. 
I shouldn't even try that. I won't, I'll ignore the colors then. But each ball has a number, right? One, one through, what is it? I know there's an eight ball, because you don't want that to go in the 10? However many there are, let's, let's pretend there's 10. And there's some number of billiard balls, yeah. So the, um, you don't seek to explain that situation merely by saying, oh, the four ball hit the three ball, and that hit the seven ball, and the, the, the seven ball was in turn hit by the, 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 the two ball. And Sure, you could do that. But eventually, you're going to get to a point where you have absolutely no choice but to appeal to some sort of initial motion that is itself outside of the pool table. The pool table would be analogous to the material realm, the whole natural universe, in other words, within which we observe a certain principle as absolute. And that principle is that nothing is the cause of its own motion that all motion is derived from something outside of itself. Now, living things have a certain sort of principle of motion within themselves, but if we look at it purely mechanically, even they don't. I'm moving right now, I'm walking, but I'm only able to walk because I'm pushing off of something, the floor. And you might say, well, there are examples of things that don't push off things outside of themselves in order to move, like a helicopter. How's that moving? Itself? No, it's pushing air, exactly. It's pushing something outside of itself, away from itself, in order to move. How about, let's take an even more, even more fitting example to try and refute this principle. A rocket ship. There's no air out there. Is it moving? Is it, does it contain within itself the principle of its own motion? How is it moving? Exactly. It's only even capable of moving because it takes fuel up with it, and it pushes the fuel out, and expends it in the opposite direction, and it's pushing off of that fuel that it's shooting out behind it. Everything that begins to move is only capable of doing that because it received its motion from outside of itself. That's one of those unavoidable facts of the universe. So all we need to do is follow that back far enough and realize that at some, some point, something, at the very minimum, must have initiated this chain of motion. We can't simply kick the can down the road forever and say that it uh, was an infinite regress because an infinite regress still doesn't explain how it began. Um, remember that Aquinas is not saying that the first mover moved itself. He's saying that things don't move themselves. He's saying that nothing moves itself. He's saying that the first mover is not self-moved, rather the first mover is unmoved. Now, that doesn't tell you exactly how to pray, for example, concluding that there's some unmoved mover. And again, that gets back to the point that he's doing philosophy here, not theology. He's simply using logic to conclude that there must be some first unmoved mover. Two, generalization of the first way. Motion is the most obvious type of change. We talked about that in the very beginning of the course with the pre-Socratics and Zeno, ironically, trying to refute the existence of motion, but I don't think anyone really believes Zeno, as we shouldn't. So you, start, you always want to start with what's most obvious. A good argument begins with what one knows. That's the problem with Anselm's argument. We'll see shortly. It doesn't begin with something that you already know. Uh, Aquinas did not believe Anselm's argument worked. If not, he, of course, agreed with his conclusion. So this generalization of the first way, the second way, simply says there must be some first uncaused cause. We can look at causality more generally than just motion. And think here about Plato's simile of the sun, a great analogy for what Aquinas is getting at here. If this, just as the sun, you can trace back just about all motion and energy and basically anything that differentiates the surface of the earth from a formless wasteland is thanks only to the sun. You trace back the cause of any sort of order and life and motion and energy and you can find your way back to the sun in just about every case. Not absolutely every case because it is an analogy. But if we look at that more generally, the cause, there must be some ultimate cause 
following back any chain of cause will have to stop somewhere. We've used the analogy before of a literal chain hanging in the fog. If it's not moving, if it's stable, you can conclude that it is anchored to something that is in turn stable and giving that chain its stability. But that's similar enough to the first way. I don't want to spend more time on it. Let's go on to the third way, which gets a little more interesting. Third way. There must be some absolutely necessary that is to say non-contingent being. Why must there be some absolutely necessary non-contingent being? Well, all of us are contingent. Each one of us is a contingent being, which simply means none of us need to exist. There was a time when we didn't exist and the universe got along just fine without us. None of us have within our existence, have, I should say, as, let me rephrase, none of us have existence as our very essence. If existence were our very essence, then there could not possibly not be in us. But again, there was a time when there wasn't in us. Why must there be at least one being that isn't like that? Well, Aquinas says there must be at least one being. And he would qualify that to say there is exactly one being. Whose being is itself an absolute logical, ontological, metaphysical necessity? Because if that were not so, then even now, the universe would have nothing to ground its existence. Nothing within which to ground its existence. Now, this is fascinating because modern uh, calculus and physics shed some light on why this is so. All arguments against God's existence in one way, shape, or form suppose an infinite regress of some sort. So if we think about an infinite regress, then let's say this is zero. This is where we are right now, the present moment. The universe goes back to infinity in time, whether it's this particular one or some infinite cycle of the universe's big crunch theory going back and back and back, infinite big bangs ago. Um, that is an infinite amount of time in the past. But here's a simple mathematical fact. Given an infinite amount of time, any possibility is guaranteed to what? To happen. It's a, guarantee, it's a mathematical guarantee. If it's even possible, even if that possibility is laughably small, even if it's point, point zero and a Googleplex zeros, one percent, it's still absolutely positively guaranteed to happen, given an infinite amount of time. So long as it is not an exponentially decaying possibility, if it is a steady possibility, and if we're talking about an infinite regress, it can't be exponentially decaying, that can only look forward. So the point here is, let me try to not get too mathematical and abstract here. The point here is that if there were no absolutely necessary being, if there were no being whose existence was absolutely necessary, then it would be possible, no matter how small this chance is, it would be possible for at some given time there to be what? Nothing in existence? Yeah, nothing at all. And if you need a physical scientific example to, to comprehend this, that's fine. Uh, modern physicists tell us, and they'll take their word for it, that there is a finite possibility that any given particle could quantum tunnel out of existence at any given moment. I, uh, I'll, I'll take their word for it. Well, if they're right, then that also means that there is a finite possibility that every single particle in the universe could quantum tunnel out of existence at the same moment. But if every single particle in the universe quantum tunneled out of existence at the same moment, then what, what would be the problem? There'd be nothing else to produce the universe from moving forward. The universe would forever be stuck in nothingness. But if that were even possible, and if we have an infinite regress, mathematically it would have been guaranteed to have happened by now. But it hasn't happened by now. Why? Because there isn't nothing. There's something. 
So the mere fact that even now there's something rather than nothing means there at least one, there's at least one being whose existence is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, existence itself would have no solid ground, and it would not have been able to survive. It would have vanished. It would have disappeared already. So our, the, this, and the calculus comes in, if you just do the integral, even if this is point, again, point zero zero, like the biggest number you can imagine, zeros and then a 1% chance, doesn't matter. You take the, if you've done pre-calc or calc, you'll, you know that if you take the integral of this function from negative infinity to zero, you'll always get a guarantee. This event is guaranteed to have happened. And I think, I don't think you really need calculus to know that. I think that's fairly common sense that any possibility, no matter how small, becomes a guarantee if it's given a truly infinite amount of time. So the universe does exist, so something's grounding its existence. All right. The fourth way, gradation in things. He says there must be some absolute standard of perfection in things. And that standard itself is the cause of the perfection of the various things that tend towards it. Think back to the beginning of this course when we talked about the meter. The only reason it's possible for us to judge meters and to say that one meter is a better meter than another meter is because there is an absolute meter. There is an absolute standard of meterness. It's in Paris. It's up until some point in the 20th century it was in Paris, now it's defined in terms of a wavelength. But it doesn't matter how it's defined, the point is it is one. I don't need to recap that whole discussion, I think you probably remember it well enough to see how it applies here in a more meaningful way. And Well, that was meaningful back then too, but this is in a, Aquinas is speaking in a much grander way now. The most beautiful thing you've ever seen or ever could see best thing you've ever seen or ever could see, the truest thing you've ever seen or ever could see, you can always imagine something more beautiful and better and truer still. How is that possible unless there is some being who himself is absolute perfection? How could you even intuit the possibility of these gradations in perfection unless there is an infinite wellspring of that perfection? You have, and he's deferring to universal human intuitions here. I'm not saying this is as logically, metaphysically bulletproof as some other methods, but I think it's still fair that we intuit that there is an absolute perfection, what, and that is more than a mere construct, but that it's in some sense real, and that we're not being arbitrary when we refer to the gradation of the various perfections and things. This is very Platonic. This is, uh, Plato, of course, sees those standards within the forms themselves, so this is kind of a Plato's God type argument, the fourth way. But the fifth way is the one I find the most interesting. It's also the most rejected today because I don't think people understand it. As soon as I write it in the board, and you probably already remember from the reading, you'll see it's associated with something that gets laughed at a lot, which is probably why this is not spoken of more. But he says there must be some designer with intelligence to give the order That we see in things, specifically living things. Because sure, there's a certain order in the cosmos and the solar system and the, and the beauty of a mountain and all and a sunset and all that stuff, but that's kind of less strong of an argument because 
you could argue that we are simply reading order and beauty into those things by appreciating them, which I don't think would be a valid argument, but I, I want to not even address it now because we can simply refer to living things which quite undeniably have incredible order in them because they are they have functional order. Functional order can't be uh, pretended into existence. It's there because the things work. All right, so the obvious and immediate rebuttal that just about anybody would give to this would be, no, this is not a valid argument for God's existence because the order that we see in living things is not from God, but from nature, specifically evolution. We don't need to get into an evolution debate now because it's actually rather tangential. It's more than tangential. It's completely unnecessary to even address for the fifth way. Because no theory can itself explain its own starting point. What is the starting, even if we take for granted everything that evolutionary theory holds, what is the starting point of evolution? A single cell capable of evolving. What they call the last universal common ancestor, the LUCA. A single cell capable of evolving is a thing of such incredible order, functionality, design, that our greatest technology pales in comparison to it. A sing so the very starting point of, ev again, we don't need to even bother with the question of evolution right now, we can take it all for granted and still see that this fifth way is completely valid, it's a completely valid point here, because we can simply look at that Luca, that last universal common ancestor. Now, I'm aware that there's theories as to how that one came about. I took a seminar class on precisely that question. I'm going to do some erasing because this will be worth using the chalkboard for a bit for. Remember, this was a long time ago now, but when I was at RPI, I was very interested to see what the best and brightest scientific minds of the world had to say about this. What is the origin of this last universal common ancestor? More recently, I did a bunch of research. I checked out a recently published Oxford Encyclopedia of Evolution, 1,800 pages long. Guess how much space it dedicates to the very starting point of evolutionary theory itself, considering the last universal common ancestor. About, yeah, it's like a page or something. So the long story short is that they have no stinking idea. Um, because clearly, order is something that cannot be explained without something, some being to give that order. Now, I'm not. I don't want you to just take my word for that. We need to philosophize a little more here to try and back that up with some inquiry. Because within that page or so, that among the 1,800, there were some, uh, some theories put forth. The primary one is the primordial soup theory that billions of years ago, the surface of the Earth was this big volcanic mass of bubbles, trillions and trillions of bubbles always coming up, bubbling up through this all this water and, and mixed with all these volcanic chemicals and everything and each of those bubbles was bumping into other bubbles and each of those collisions had a certain chance of causing a chemical reaction which in turn had a certain chance of causing um, a certain amino acid which could cause a certain protein which could then bump to other proteins and, and start building a cell and then after a long enough time finally there was enough of this bumping going on that randomly generated this last universal common ancestor. But it never goes any further than that, the, the theories, because frankly there's not much more that can be said except precisely that conjecture. Uh, the, the, I still remember the class itself, when they got to that point, they just said, um, it just emerged. It just emerged, that's, that's all they could say. The, uh, but let's test this emergence. Now you, you could hear it, you've probably heard it said, given enough time, a monkey with a typewriter will what? Anyone heard this, this analogy? Pound out Shakespeare. That's, what the, that, that's the pseudo axiom appealed to, to say, sure, given enough bumps, 
bubbles bumping together in this primordial soup, eventually a cell is going to pop out of it. Um, that assertion needs to be tested with reason. And that's what we're going to do right now real quick. So let's take this monkey typewriter hypothesis and apply just some rudimentary logical analysis to it. Let's take one work of Shakespeare and let's suppose that if only these, and by the way, the point of the analogy is to say that randomness can cause order given enough time. Shakespeare, a work of Shakespeare is of course a work of great order and a monkey pounding at a typewriter is going to just randomly hit keys. So the purpose of this, uh, of this old saying is that just give enough time and order is going to come from randomness. Okay, so again, let's quickly test this. And don't worry, I'm not going to test you on this. Let's just test this proposition. Hamlet. Let's take one work of Shakespeare, Hamlet. Hamlet, if I recall, is about 180,000 letters long, individual letters. So the monkey with the typewriter has a fairly simple task in front of him. To get the first, what are the chances that he'll randomly pound the first letter correct? 1 over 26. What's the chance that he'll pound the second letter correct? Yeah, times that again. So we only have to do this whenever you have successive events and the probability of a given event, you multiply the probabilities together to see the chance of them both occurring as, as you want to see it happen. So if, to get the first letter correct would be a 1 over 26 chance. And I'm being very generous here because I'm ignoring punctuation, I'm ignoring capitals, so I'm really being easy on these monkeys. To get the second letter correct also would be times another 126. So we don't need to do this 180,000 times because we have exponents. If anyone has a phone handy or a calculator handy, can you just, God bless you, toss that in and tell me what it says? I don't want, I don't want to tell you, I, want to, I don't want you to have to take my word for it. I want to, I want to hear it from a student because none of you guys are in on this. <laughs> yeah, any, any calculator is going to say the same thing. Zero. That's not an error. There's a zero percent chance of it happening. It's mathematically impossible. What does yours say? It just says error. It just says error? Okay. That's just Hamlet. That's just the odds of Hamlet coming about from randomness. A single cell capable of evolving is nothing compared to Hamlet. Sorry, the other way around. Hamlet is nothing in complexity compared to a single cell capable of evolving. Hamlet is 180,000 pieces of information, 180,000 letters. You get those right, you got Hamlet. Seems to be an easy task. A single cell capable of evolving is billions, if not trillions, of pieces of information in the exact correct configuration. Um, makes, ha makes generating Hamlet from randomness look easy. Now you might say, hold on, this isn't literally the same thing as zero. For all intents and purposes it may be, but you could put a number in onto that if you had a powerful enough calculator, and indeed you could. I've continued this calculation many times though. Give, we're not working with, you, you might think back to what I was talking about the third way, and say, well hold on, you just said that any probability, no matter how small, given an infinite amount of time is guaranteed to occur. Well, yes, it is, but we're not talking about an infinite amount of time here. We're talking about the constraints of the, of the universe, which physicists tell us is like 13 billion years old. Well, so let's again just take their word for that. I've met, I, we could, if, I don't want to bore you guys with this, so I won't go through it. I have bored other students with this by going through it all on the chalkboard, but I'll spare you that unless anyone really wants me to. Give this monkey typewriter quasi-axiom, pseudo-axiom, every conceivable possible benefit of the doubt and still calculates a 0% chance. I've done, I, I, I've given it every possible benefit. I've said, okay, let's suppose that every single atom in the universe, it's about 10 to the 80th atoms in the universe, let's suppose that every single one of those atoms is a monkey with a typewriter. Every single one of them has had the entire 13 billion year history of the universe to pound at their typewriter. Every single one of them is an expert typist, typing at 100 words a minute. Just continue that calculation and then see what the odds are of just Hamlet coming about from randomness. You would think, wow, 
with all with that, with those ridiculous benefits of the doubt should be guaranteed. It still works out to absolute zero. Order can't come from randomness. It can only come from someone with an idea in mind and the ability to put that idea into practice. Uh, we of course know that, but when we appeal to pseudo axioms that have no philosophical worth, like give a monkey a typewriter long enough, and he'll pound out Shakespeare, we're just lying to ourselves. There was some attention grabbing guy some years ago who claimed that his software monkeys already did type out Shakespeare. Um, the various journalists who interviewed him must not have known anything about math, because when I actually read what he said, he just blatantly lied. He, in other words, he had a bunch of software algorithms going, choosing random letters, and he said they already, they already did it. They already came up with, with Hamlet. No, they didn't. They came up with the individual words, which is nothing compared to the complexity of the work Hamlet. You might as well say that as soon as all 26 letters have been pounded randomly, that the monkeys have succeeded, which is obviously absurd. Uh, a simple 128-bit encryption key, if you really don't want something to be uh, read, you can encrypt it with 128-bit encryption. And if someone really wants to read it, they can try to brute force attack it with a computer to guess random uh, combinations of bits. So it's only 128 bits, and a bit is just a zero or a one. So it's nothing compared to cracking him. Like, it's, it's almost literally nothing. Not absolutely literally nothing, but almost literally nothing. Hamlet is 180,000 options with 26 options, 26, sorry, 180,000 choices with 26 options each. A 128-bit encryption key is 128 choices with two options each. Ask any computer scientist about a 128-bit encryption and he will tell you that it is logically unbreakable. Give the best supercomputer in the world trillions of years and it's still won't be able to break a single 128-bit encryption key. That's what they do. They use randomness. They, they fill it with random numbers to try and figure out what the key is. They can never do it. It's undoable. If someone breaks an encryption key, they didn't do it with randomness. They did it because they knew it already. Good question. They shouldn't bother with it. <laughs> they really shouldn't. They shouldn't even bother with 128. 64 would be more than 64 bit encryption would be more than enough. Um, I think it's just they're always kind of working to outdo themselves in that field. Conceivably, there could be better computers in the future that right now the world, again, I specifically researched this to make sure that the, I even did the math to see how long it would take the world's best supercomputer as of 2019, how long it would take it to break the 128 bit encryption. It was hundreds of trillions of years. Um, but you could argue that maybe when quantum computers come about, it'll only take them a few centuries to break the 128-bit encryption key. Uh, and so then we need 256-bit. Still, it's absolutely nothing compared to Hamlet, which um, is absolutely nothing compared to the complexity of a single cell. So it's kind of a, an irrelevant question, the evolution one, because again, it's a very starting point. It's no theory, certainly not evolution, no theory at all can ever explain its own starting points. It takes its starting points from outside of itself. Starting point of evolution does not explain how order got there. So I think the fifth way is just as unbroken and just as valid as ever, even though everybody just laughs at it today because of evolution. I don't understand why more people don't ever talk about the last universal common ancestor self, but there we have it. So let's move on to the next question here. There's, uh, there's enough of the five ways. Problem of evil. First of all, the problem of evil itself is not exactly new to the Middle Ages. This is as old as, uh, I'm sure it's as old as mankind. People have been completely understandably perplexed by the conflict of a few observations. Because of the existence of evil, the problem goes, and that evil generally pains suffering. I'll put them all down, I guess. Evil, pain, suffering exist. 
God either must three possibilities. One, not exist. Two, not be good. Or three, not be all powerful. So, unless you're really into the power of positive thinking, and this won't last for too long, you can't deny the existence of evil. We all know there's evil out there, and if you don't believe that, just turn on the news. So clearly there's evil. How is that possible if there's a God who is all-powerful and is good, therefore does not want there to be evil? This seems to make no sense, and it's a very valid concern. I, I'm not at all dismissing this flippantly. This was first posed so clearly by an ancient Greek. Unfortunately, I can't remember the na his name. Um, but it's certainly much older than the Middle Ages philosophers, but they brought to bear their philosophical efforts on it. Because it had always been addressed, I mean, this problem has always been addressed. One of the oldest Hebrew texts is all about this. The uh, book of Job is all about this problem of evil. But that's a theological, religious uh, answer to the question. Augustine and Aquinas wanted to give a philosophical one. So, the first thing here that they said, this is Augustine. Augustine points out, or argues, that evil is the absence of good, not a substance. So you can't say, why did God make evil? Because it's a privation. It's like saying, why did, did that flashlight make a shadow? Well, the flashlight didn't make the shadow. Something that got in the way of the light made the shadow. A substance is something created. Uh, a, an in, anything created by God, of course, if God is good, would itself have to be good. A good God cannot create an evil thing. That would be contrary to his nature as perfect goodness. That's pretty straightforward. So if evil was created by God, then God is not completely good. And we have some sort of a dualist type view, which Augustine certainly didn't hold. Or actually, actually a dualist type view would be more of a so if there's two gods, one's good, one's evil, and that's why there's evil. But that's not at all the view of God that Augustine had, and certainly not the view of God that is in Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. Rather, they, all these, these major religions hold that God is all-powerful and all-good. So it really doesn't seem to make sense here. But again, if we hold that evil is a privation, just a shadow is a privation of light, then we do not need to specifically attribute its creation to God. It could rather very easily be, quote, created by something else. Only God can create a substance, but a privation can be caused by all sorts of things. But that's not a sufficient answer. Why? This is not a sufficient answer to the problem of evil. Why? So, okay, great. God didn't make evil, but why doesn't he Stop. Yeah, why doesn't he destroy it? Why doesn't he stop it? Well, here's where Aquinas comes in. He says, yeah, God didn't make evil, but that's not a satisfying enough answer. Aquinas says that God only even permits an evil. Any evil to occur. Three conditions are met. First condition. He must know that a good will come from it. Two. 
two. That good must be greater than the permitted evil. Three, there must have been no other possible way. And of all the various conclusions one can come to philosophically, I think this is about as consoling as it gets. Because if you do believe in a good and all-powerful God, then it logically follows that any evil, any pain, any suffering, anything bad of any sort is only even allowed if a greater good is guaranteed to come from it in time. Pure philosophy. There is no appeal to any religious text in, in concluding this. And this does not prove, I'm not saying this proves God's existence, and of course it doesn't. This is not an attempt to be a proof of God's existence. This is simply a rebuttal to the problem of evil being itself presented as an argument against God. But no, there can indeed be evil. Temporarily, there will come a time when it's gone. There can indeed be <coughs> evil um, <coughs> being in existence for a time and, have, and that can be logically consistent with the existence of a good and all-powerful God if every single evil that occurs is specifically only allowed to occur if this good and all-powerful God knows for absolute certain that he will bring a greater good out of it. And if, there, and if he's really good, he'd do it some other way without allowing the evil. So that third condition is also necessary. There must be no other possible way. And you could say, well, how is that third condition? How does that jive with omnipotence? Well, it does. Omnipotence does not mean the ability to make contradictions. It just means being all-powerful, being able to do all things. Contradiction is, by definition, that which is not a thing. A square triangle is not a thing. God's inability to make a square triangle doesn't, uh, doesn't detract from his omnipotence. A forced free will is not a thing. Uh, uh, bringing about an effect that is intrinsically linked to a cause without that cause, generally speaking, is not a thing at all. It's a conscious... A, it's just nonsense. So yes, there are some things, there are non-things that even omnipotence is incapable of, not because it's limited, but because it is unlimited. Because for it to cause a contradiction would actually be a defect. And omnipotence cannot admit any defect. Okay. And so on. I'm gonna run real quickly through the rest here. I wanna I want to give you the final before we usually take our break. So you guys can, I mean, you can still feel free to go to the bathroom anytime you need to during the final, but uh, that's still my plan. Okay, Anselm's ontological argument is very strange. And if you thought it was strange when you read it, that's okay, because it, uh, Aquinas himself thinks it's strange, thinks it doesn't work. And the moral of the story is you can agree with somebody's conclusion. That doesn't mean you have to condone the arguments they use to get there. Anselm, and by the way, it might be unjust to even say that he was presenting a strict argument here. This is taken from his work, The Proslogion, which is very meditative, and it might have been more of just a meditation on God's greatness than, than a specific argument for God's existence, although it certainly has some aspects of an argument, some elements. Anselm says that God is that greater than which none can be conceived but to exist in reality is greater to exist only in the mind.
Therefore, in accordance with our presupposition in the beginning of the argument, if God is indeed that greater in which none can be conceived, and if it's greater to exist in reality than just in the mind, then therefore this being must also exist in reality, not just in the mind. Three dots, therefore God must exist in reality and not just the mind. Obviously God exists in people's minds at the very minimum. There are many people who believe in it, most people, and not just the mind. But it's obviously also it's just as obviously a greater thing to exist in reality than just as a figment of imagination. So it's difficult to say what exactly is wrong with this, actually, other than it clearly is wrong. It clearly is weak. It's hard to spot its weakness, though. People say different things when they're asked why it's wrong, and I'm not saying I have a correct answer to why it's wrong either, except to say that it doesn't begin. Aquinas starts his arguments very well. He starts arguments in the Socratic way. He starts with something that is already very clearly understood and very clearly granted by the person he's talking with. Aquinas says, look, things are moving. You all know that. What does that tell us? And look, things have order. Living things clearly have a designed order. What does that tell us? He's starting with things we know. He's building logically on them and seeing what we can conclude from that. And so I'm starting with this kind of strange quasi-definition of God that's not a very good one anyway, and he's trying to mine things out of that kind of not very good definition. It's kind of like trying to figure out all sorts of details about the cellular structure of a leaf by putting a picture of a leaf on a microscope. What's the, what might be the problem with that? <laughs> no effect is greater than its cause. You cannot get information out of something that wasn't there in the first place. But anyway, I don't want to be too hard on Anselm. He, he, he's a uh, He's considered a saint, actually, just like Aquinas and Augustine. Great man, great philosopher as well, but something, something's off here. And Aquinas was not afraid to point that out in his own writings, that something was off in Anselm's argument. You don't need to have anything down with for a logical flaw. I don't know why I asked you guys for that in the discussion sheet. I'm not going to test you on it, and that's too difficult to go through anyway. Finally, Boethius. Real quick here. Um, Boethius philosopher who wrote the Consolation of Philosophy, a statesman executed for his principles, similar to Socrates, although not as exciting, maybe. The Consolation of Philosophy is one of the most popular books in history since it was written. If you, uh, anyone ever seen the movie 2012, End of the World type movie? It's enjoyable to watch. If you pause it in the very first scene, you'll see the main character is reading the Constellation of Philosophy, and that's how the movie starts. Um, Boethius is wrestling philosophically with all of these most pressing questions that his life is presented to him. It's given in the figure, it's very poetic, it's given, it's not a dry Aristotelian treatise, it's given in the tone of philosophy appears to him in the prison cell as this lady, lady philosophy, and she tells him things. Um, Philosophy is usually personified as a woman, a wisdom, Sophia. So philosophy tells Boethius all sorts of things in prison. But the key here, we don't need to go into great detail with this, but it's just probably the second biggest thing that people struggle with philosophically with God after the problem of evil is the problem of divine foreknowledge. We all know that we are free, but how can we be free if God knows what we're going to do? that seems to be at odds, to know that something is going to happen, seems to imply that that something is what? Determined. That's the, it's uh, deterministic. It's just like the billiard balls in the pool table. You can calculate what they're going to do with Newton's laws very easily. Therefore, they are not free. So if God knows, we must be determined. But Boethius says that's not true because you're looking at time itself incorrectly or God's relation to time incorrectly. Looking at time correctly is probably the single most difficult metaphysical thing to do. And we struggle with that greatly to this day. Um, but Boethius says, God's foreknowledge is real. He really does know what you're gonna do. You really do have a destiny, in other words. You really are, you really have a fate, a glorious fate. It's not supposed to be morbid. 
but you're also free. God's foreknowledge is real, Boethius says, but does not preclude human free will. In other words, does not determine human action. Why? Well, he says, because God is a being beyond time itself. <coughs> Seeing all past, present, and future immediately before himself, immediately before his eyes, if you will. So it's not that he's predicting what you're going to do because you're so darn predictable and you're not really free. No. It's that he's got all of past, present, and future sitting right in front of him like a picture and he sees it all. He's not predicting what you will do, he's looking at what you are doing. But you do not exist in the future yet, because we are not eternal beings, but temporal ones. You know, any of this down to Boethius is expounding upon our nature as temporal, indeed, so we only exist in the present. We remember the past, we have no idea what our future will involve, and we only exist in the present. But God's existence transcends all time. Therefore, that includes past, present, and future, and eternity. He's equally present in all of them. So he doesn't have to do any predicting. He just sees it happening. Interesting. Mystery, yes, certainly. But it's not a logical contradiction. So we can at least say it somewhat resolves a dilemma. But whenever these philosophers expound upon these mysteries of God, they're not pretending to have exhausted the matter and figured it out. You've got to understand that they're not saying they've got the last word on it and, and, and all is said and done. Just that they're trying to resolve some contradictions that might appear when pondering these questions. And there's the introduction of philosophy. <laughs>